Hi, just a quick one, not really electronics related as such, but uh, you know, I figure I'd at least shoot a video about it. Now, this is my lab, obviously, and the lighting in here is actually pretty piss poor. And if you've seen my videos, you probably don't notice it because my Canon HF G10 camera has a really excellent low light sensor in it and it compensates for the lack of light in here, especially in the corner. And uh, I'll show you my uh, lighting at the moment, just standard office um, trough type luminary. So I just thought I could see what I can do to improve the lighting in here, install some new tubes, maybe clean the things and get some uh, light measurements to see how much a difference it actually makes. So let's get on with it. Now here's the main corner of my lab and um, probably somewhat foolishly, I've only got um, just the one light in this entire area here. I've got another one that's uh, just inside the, um, the uh, office cubicle part of it there, but it's on like the opposite side of the door. So I do get some light coming across onto my face as I'm uh, shooting the videos, but that's not that great. And there's only one tube in here and that basically does both of these benches here, which is really crazy. I mean, I've got another one. Well, there's another one here which sort of does this teardown bench as well, but that's only got one uh, tube in it as well. And I've got another light over there. And basically I, I've got a total of nine in the entire uh, office space and they've only got one um, tube in them each. And they're probably the original tubes. Uh, since I moved in, I haven't changed them. I haven't cleaned the filters. Uh, so they're likely very dirty. And uh, well, I thought we'd do some light measurements and uh, see how we can improve it by installing maybe some quad uh, phosphor uh, lights and just cleaning them out. So let's try and get some direct measurements first. And here's the light meter I've got in an optimal position on my, this is just on my main bench here. This is my uh, main bench as you see in the video and this is my tear down side of the bench and it's directly under the uh, light there. And as you can see, I'm only getting just over 200 lux there. And that is uh, pretty much uh, well below the uh, recommended um, office standard, I think, which is like over 300 lux or something like that. So it's pretty poor. So that um, low value would uh, take into account the um, the age of the tube, of course, it loses um, uh, light output as it ages, plus the diffuser in there, and it's probably not uh, clean as well. So that is a good reference level for the bench. And here's the back corner of the lab where I have my camera set up, and that's my live uh, notebook over there. They use the live shows, and it's only 170 lux sort of stand in here. And if I go over here, it's at the notebook here it's only a hundred lux and way over in the corner here if I get out of the you know we're only talking 70 lux it's terrible now let's see what happens if I simply clean the uh, diffuser up on the light luminary above me I'm, I'm, I won't touch this I'll leave it exactly where it is we're getting 207 208 lux so let's clean the diffuser and see what happens and if you're wondering what I get without the diffuser at all we're talking 200 and exactly the same, 208 lux. Go figure, I was uh, a bit surprised about that. I expected um, it to be uh, sort of, you know, a, a decent increase at least without that diffuser. And here's the pattern that's all over the diffuser itself. But if you flip it over and have a look at the backside, you can maybe see, you know, if I get the right angle, you can see the substantial dust there. Look at that. Can I draw a smiley face? Yes, I can. And we're talking quite substantial amounts of dust too. Let's just swipe that and look at that. Ugh. But what do you know? You put the diffuser back in and bingo, we do actually have an increase. 212, 213 lux or thereabouts. So that, you know, just uh, getting in there and uh, wiping out that dust does actually make a difference. Not much, but it does. It's certainly, um, you know, sort of worth up maintaining when you go in there to replace the, uh, you know, the tube or the uh, starter. Now I've taken the tube out and uh, you may think that, that hasn't changed much because I'm not uh, shooting at a constant uh, exposure 
uh, set in here. So it is like um, really quite uh, dark in that corner now. <laughs> Trust me, it's not that great. And the reading, almost 39 lux. There you go. So that is <laughs> very uh, dim in the scheme of things. It's just that my cam camera is really good at, uh, you know, like even un right up under the bench under there, you know, you can probably can't see any noise in the image because of the good sensor in my Canon HF G10. But if I turn the lights off completely, that's <laughs> the kind of uh, shot that we get. And you can see the uh, noise, you should be able to see the all the grainy noise on the white wall there. Probably a pretty horrible image. And lux wise, we're only talking 0.3 lux. That's nothing. Now I've gone and got myself a couple of these uh, NEC branded uh, quad phosphor HGX extra high grade uh, 5000 uh, K color temperature tubes to replace the ones I've got. Now the ones that came out of here are these uh, thorn ones as you can see and uh, there's no color grading on those but my camera uh, tells me the light in the lab here is about uh, 4000 K so there might have been uh, the cool white 4200 and they may have uh, dropped in color temperature with time or something like that but uh, decide to put 5000 K in the new ones um, because A they will be uh, brighter and uh, B I do have some uh, studio uh, lights as well some portable studio lights that are also 5000 K so I might standardize on 5000 K and maybe eventually um, change them all. Now as you can see you might be able to see a little bit of blackening on the original tubes. I'm, I'm assuming that they've been in here for uh, probably the life of the office. You know they haven't been used that much because you can tell when they're you know they're really going out that uh, they'll start to blacken on the ends but they haven't really done that too much. And with the new NEC 5000K globe in there, I get 246, 249. Oh, we're talking, you know, 250 odd lux. So that's a significant improvement, I think. And that's with the uh, diffuser in place after it's uh, warmed up. When it first uh, turned on from cold, it started at about 180 lux and then uh, worked its way up to uh, 250. And I have no idea if you're going to be able to see the color difference here but that's the uh, new 5000 K one and that's the older uh, 4000 K ones installed and the new ones are significantly whiter and brighter as you'd expect because they're a higher color temperature and I believe these NEC ones uh, don't contain any mercury there's no uh, marking on them at all as such and there's a uh, similar marking on the um, uh, cheaper ones you know warning contains mercury and there's no you know HG uh, symbol on the tube or anything like that. And if we plug our energy meter here into the uh, single 36 watt tube luminary, uh, measuring our power consumption around about 53 watts. That's like 40 over 40% 40 more than the 36 watts rated on the tube. And that'll be because of the efficiency or the lack of efficiency um, of the ballast and the uh, power factor correction capacitor. And after I installed two of these NEC quad phosphor lights up there, I'm now getting 410 lux on the bench. Beautiful. And yes, I know what everyone's thinking. Why don't I just install LED ones? You can get the LED replacement uh, tubes up there. And well, yeah, I might eventually uh, do that, but they're very expensive um, here in Australia at least if for the good quality ones well upwards of hundred dollars per tube and yes I can save some energy that will bring that you know uh, 50 odd uh, watts uh, per tube basically down to you know uh, 25 or 30 watts or something like that um, so there's significant energy savings to be had there with LEDs but eh, that's for another day and while I've got this fitted down, I just thought it'd be interesting to, if we could probe the uh, current going into uh, this luminary fitting with my AM iProber 520. I've got the little uh, toroid attachment on it around the active input there, and there it is. And uh, it's going into my scope, so let's check it out. And here's a simple DaveCAD drawing of how one of these uh, fluorescent lights work. We've got our mains input over here we've got our power factor correction cap directly across the mains input to compensate for the inductance of this thing and we've got our ballast 
up here which helps limit the uh, current when it starts up and we've got our tube here with two filaments either end and they go in series through a starter like this. Now how it works is that when you first apply the mains power this starter is just a timer basically it's a switch and it uh, close it's normally closed when the mains is first applied and that's why you've got the ballast to prevent a huge inrush current just forget about the power factor correction cap for a second assume it's not there the if you didn't have the ballast there in series the filaments would just <laughs> they'd blow up bang because there'd be too much current flowing directly through there you'd have both filaments directly across the mains input so the ballast just limits the inrush current there and the starter after uh, you know a couple of seconds it switches off and uh, that allows current to flow uh, and, uh, well the uh, filaments heat up of course during that uh, uh, process and then it allows current to flow through the vapor inside the tube and then hopefully once it's all started bang it reaches a steady state condition and the starter just has an RFI suppression cap built across the contacts there because when this contact discharges of course there's lots of RFI there and the reason these things flicker occasionally is because this starter if it opens at the wrong time it usually just contains a uh, a metal strip in there and when it heats up then it opens so the timing's you know not uh, very exact so um, if it opens at the wrong time then there's not enough uh, inductive kick uh, to generate the high voltage required to uh, switch on the electrons flowing through the tube. So it starts again and boop, after a couple of attempts, it'll finally luck upon it and start it up and kick on the tube. And once it is, of course, the current actually flows, the uh, electrons flow through the tube itself, the uh, vapor inside there. And uh, the starter has no effect at all. So I thought we'd do a few simple uh, current measurements here. Let's measure the mains input current here. Let's measure the current through our power factor correction cap down here. And let's also measure the starter current down here. And here we go. I just captured the switch on and we'll be able to zoom into that and have a look. All right, let's zoom into this. We started out at uh, zero current. There's a switch on there. There's some big spikes there and then it goes steady state once it was on and as you can see it took uh, well, you know one and a half seconds to sort of switch on to uh, steady state there and that's that's a switch on current so I'm not exactly sure what's happening there something to do with the starter and uh, the ballast of course and we can zoom this across and whoa look at that look at that high frequency crap there there's a whole bunch of that just in this part of the waveform here rather interesting and then we get a different wave shape again you'll notice this wave shape in this part is different to that one and let's go let's go along look there's a little spike in there little tiny spike we've got this is the advantage of the deep memory you can um, a deep memory scope this one's got uh, four meg uh, sample memory so you can really capture long waveforms like that and then zoom in and see details like that spike so oh, and then we've got a funny little odd pulse around there and we've got that again and it sort of decays it sort of jumps up and then decays back down we've got a couple of flickers there because I think it did flicker like four times and uh, due to the starter so that's the starter kicking in and then we eventually once it's fully on boom we get back to that wave shape again which you'll notice is of course different to the wave shape we're getting when when it's during the uh, starter it hasn't actually kicked in yet most interesting and then yeah that's all steady state across there like that beautiful and there was one spike I missed which is right in here in this part of it between the starting operation that really jumps right down low like that and really it's just a mess look at that boom and then back up wonderful now let's try and capture the current in the starter I'll plug it in and here we go bang look at that 
look what we have here. Interesting. Right at the start here, for 300 milliseconds, we have that mysterious looking waveform. Then after that, it really starts to pump it in and we get that triangle shaped waveform again. Once again, that sort of, uh, that sort of rise which we saw before, it's exactly the same. And then we've got that noise spike there as it switches off clearly. Um, and then, because it, uh, it obviously tries to start a few times, and then once it kicks in, bang, steady state, no more current through the starter. And let's try and capture the same thing, but instead of through the starter, through the tube filament. Let's go. And bingo, look what we've captured. Here we go. At the start, got the same thing we got before. We get the starter trying to kick in with our triangle shaped waveform there. And then once it kicks in steady state, bang, we get the same waveform we'll see on our mains input. And let's capture the current through the power factor correction capacitor across the mains. We expect just a basic sine wave here to be captured. Bang, there it is. There's the switch on, but after that, after that, we expect just the regular mains sinusoidal waveform. That's exactly what we get. Beautiful. So there you go. I hope you found that uh, interesting. And if you want to discuss it, how these things work or uh, discuss anything, jump on over to the EEV blog forum. And remember, if you liked the video, please give it a big thumbs up. Catch you next time.